Thank you, uh, Magnus. That was a very gracious uh, introduction. And thank you all for coming. I'm glad that the Republican debate is not tonight. I know that would be a big draw up here in Williamstown. And uh, I'm just glad that that's not uh, going on and uh, that the Red Sox are out of the playoffs, because I know that would also be a big draw. I'm a, I'm a Red Sox fan, so it's, it's OK. And uh, a heartbroken one, as usual. Uh, that comes with the territory. I, at least I can say in my life that I uh, have seen two World Series victories. I can die a happy man. So anything that happens at this point, Teo Epstein can go to Chicago. You know, uh, Big Poppy can go to New York. It's okay with me. I've got two victories under my belt. So um, I thought, though, rather than talk about baseball, uh, we'd talk about uh, uh, Wall Street and why and how uh, Wall Street keeps doing this to us. Why do we keep getting into so much trouble uh, that they are responsible for? And of course, that uh, assumption alone uh, is somewhat controversial because when I uh, interviewed people for uh, uh, my book on about how Bear Stearns collapsed or how Goldman almost collapsed, of course, they don't view it that way at all. They they view it as sort of, well, these things happen once a century. And, uh, you know, Bill, what, why do you keep persisting in saying that um, people on Wall Street are responsible uh, for uh, this crisis and, uh, frankly, the near demise of, of capitalism? In fact, you know, uh, uh, Lenin and Stalin have got nothing on the Wall Street bankers who uh, uh, almost uh, brought down capitalism, uh, you know, three years ago. Uh, and if it weren't for, uh, you know, all of us taxpayers, pumping in something like uh, $2 trillion worth of money uh, to the Wall Street firms, uh, they would have gone uh, the way of all flesh. So uh, I've studied this very carefully. I worked on Wall Street for 17 years. I've written three books about Wall Street in the last six years. Uh, I feel that I'm as well educated on this topic as, uh, as anyone. Uh, and uh, I'm here to tell you that this was, unfortunately, uh, a man-made uh, crisis, did not have to happen. And so uh, what I thought I would do is tell you why that happened. Uh, and, um, you know, maybe by illuminating how and why it happened, uh, you know, we can all sort of collectively uh, put pressure uh, on people who can do something about it and make sure it doesn't happen uh, again. Um, it's a little known fact, as, as uh, uh, Magnus said, maybe it's not a little known fact that I was on the the Daily Show on April uh, 28th. Um, that was actually my second appearance. By the way, it doesn't get any better than being on on, on the Daily Show, uh, you know. Uh, and it's even better that you know John Stewart has a thing now where he, uh, if you run over, uh, I don't know whether it's guests he likes or guests he can't understand what they're saying. Uh, he he then encourages them to stick around, and then he puts what they say, throws it up on the web, as he says. Uh, so uh, this time, he, we were talking, and he said, you know, stick around, and we'll, I'll put what you say up on the web afterwards. And one of the things that I said uh, uh, after, uh, you know, we were off camera, but it was on the web, is that I really don't understand why uh, there hasn't been any protests uh, about uh, this financial crisis. And this was, this was April 28th, it's documented, you can go see it. And I said, I'm not a violent person, but I really don't understand the, the kinds of things that Wall Street perpetrated, and not only Wall Street, but you know, there's many people to, to, that are responsible for this, but, but primarily Wall Street. Uh, they sort of ex provided the accelerant for this crisis. Uh, why people aren't out in the streets protesting against this? And I said, I'm not a, a violent person, but it really, I don't really understand uh, why this is happening. And then uh, in, on May 11th, um, I used to be a regular uh, New York Times columnist. Uh, a, a long, long story short, my editors left, and they went and started uh, uh, the, the columnist program at Bloomberg, and so they wanted me to come, so now I'm a columnist at Bloomberg. But my, my last column for the New York Times on May 11th uh, was uh, about the same thing. Uh, you know, uh, it was called, you know, don't, don't lose the anger, uh, uh, why uh, nobody has been prosecuted for what were, was clearly criminal behavior here. I don't understand why people aren't uh, protesting uh, in the streets about this. And then, lo and behold, September 17th comes around, and now we have, you know, Occupy Wall Street. And then I've written two columns in Bloomberg for the last two weeks um, about my reflections on what I've seen down there. Uh, and uh, the first one was, it uh, sort of reminded me 
of a, of a street fair, and I was just trying to be reportorial. I wasn't trying to be condescending or cynical in any way, but I just thought it reminded me of a street fair in, instead of something that I could really uh, sink my teeth in and, and hope that people w you know, could result in something substantial. And then last week I, I wrote about how there are all these inherent contradictions with the way they're getting funded. And while they talk about uh, you know, sort of 99 versus one, uh, in fact, uh, you know, the, the, these people, the people down there and the people who are their purported leaders are backed by huge financial organizations that uh, are billionaires and, you know, are, as, as, the, as the headline said, uh, enjoy the pearls of capitalism. So naturally, you can imagine that on the one hand, you know, on, in April and then in May, you know, I'm talking about why there hasn't been protests. Then the protest comes along. And what is this, you know, Bill Cohen, aren't you the guy who said in April and May that we should be protesting, now we are protesting, and you're criticizing us or you're condescending to us? Uh, and I try to explain that, no, that's not really what I'm doing, but I can understand uh, uh, why they feel that way. So what I would like to do tonight is tell you, and hopefully uh, somehow the message will filter out to the people down in Zuccotti Square, uh, uh, I I'm disappointed in them. In other words, uh, I wish they uh, uh, had taken the time to educate. And I've offered to go down there and, and, and offer a tutorial uh, where I spend all day, if that's what it takes, explaining the way Wall Street really works. I haven't, it hasn't been taken up yet. That doesn't mean it won't be. But So in the absence of that, I thought I would uh, share with you what I think is wrong with Wall Street, what needs to be changed, why they keep getting us uh, into these uh, crises, uh, why this one was Wall Street's fault and, and what we can try to do about it. So even though they're not hearing my message, uh, maybe you all can hear it and maybe by the power of uh, the internet or osmosis or, or conversation, it'll filter out and there's a, a chance for uh, a real change. The, the opening line in my book about Goldman Sachs it, uh, was, is, uh, you know, Wall Street has always been a very dangerous place. And that is true. And I don't mean because uh, people come along and blow up explosives at 23 Wall Street where J.P. Morgan uh, had its building or that, you know, there are protests on Wall Street. I mean to, to operate and work uh, at a Wall Street firm is a very dangerous place. And just to give you some examples from, from Goldman's history, you know, it's 143 years old now. It has been in and out of trouble its entire existence. Uh, uh, in, in, 19, in 1888, for instance, it started in the uh, commercial paper business, which was uh, buying and selling of IOUs from small businesses, and it sold one uh, IOU to an investor, and, and this is in 1888, and the investor lost money, and he sued Goldman Sachs in, in uh, state court, and this became, and probably wasn't the first time, that the idea of caveat emptor became uh, a well-known uh, 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 legal principle, but uh, it was used to basically say, you know, uh, sorry, uh, buyer, you bought this piece of paper, it's your responsibility, and Goldman Sachs does not have the responsibility. And, you know, it's an enchanting thought to think of, had that decision come out differently, uh, there would be no Goldman Sachs today, and that was in 1888. And in 1929, of course, Goldman Sachs uh, put its name on what was, became the Goldman Sachs Trading Corporation, which was a, basically this huge, massive Ponzi scheme where investors lost billions of dollars. Uh, uh, one of the investors was the comedian Eddie Cantor, who uh, used Goldman Sachs in a punchline for the next five years because he lost $100,000. And so, uh, you know, the kinds of criticisms we hear now of Goldman Sachs uh, were going on from 1929 to 1935 uh, for six years. And by my uh, logic, uh, they've got, still got about four years to go. Uh, 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 being criticized before they get out of the doghouse. Uh, in the 1940s and 50s, the U.S. government, nobody remembers this anymore, the Justice Department brought an antitrust suit against Wall Street and named 17 Wall Street firms uh, who claimed to be colluding on the underwriting of debt and equity securities and using their positions uh, on boards of directors of these companies to get all this investment banking business and to keep competitors out. It was absolutely fascinating 
a lawsuit uh, that went nowhere because the judge in the case, Judge Medina, uh, threw out the case uh, uh, on summary judgment. And, uh, but his opinion about it, which is like 450 pages long, which uh, uh, is, you know, is absolutely, I hate to say this, only some you know, Wall Street geek like me would read this, but absolutely fascinating reading about the way Wall Street worked and the incredible lengths firms like Goldman Sachs went to to keep competitors out of doing debt and equity underwritings uh, for, for corporations. But yet the judge ruled that you know, there were enough banks around and enough competition uh, so that uh, there wasn't uh, collusion. Uh, in, in 1970, Goldman Sachs, uh, which had uh, equity capital at that time of $45 million, uh, was involved in the bankruptcy of Penn Central ba of Railroad, which was the largest single bankruptcy uh, to that time in this country. Goldman Sachs had underwritten a commercial paper and was sold to investors all around the country, uh, uh, mirroring what they did and were accused of doing 40 years later. Uh, Goldman Sachs knew that Penn Central was going into bankruptcy, continued to sell the commercial paper to investors all around the country. Uh, they had 10 million of this paper themselves on their, on their books. Uh, they uh, demanded that Penn Central buy this paper back from them at par, at 100 cents on the dollar, while their their customers uh, bought this paper at 100 cents of the dollar and watched it go to zero. Goldman Sachs was then sued by these customers for $85 million. Now, again, it seems like small chump change now, but Goldman's uh, uh, whole capital, which came from their partners, was $45 million. Had they lost these lawsuits, and they did lose a lot of them, but they had, if they had lost them all, there, there's this additionally tantalizing thought that in 1970, Goldman Sachs would literally have gone out of business. In the end, they did lose a lot of these lawsuits. They actually went to trial and they lost, if you can imagine, Goldman Sachs allowing a lawsuit to go to trial in this day and age. Of course, uh, it wouldn't happen, but in 1970, they, it did happen. They lost a number of these trials, but it turned out it was small enough dollars so that they managed to get out of it. But in 1970, they almost went out of business. In 1987, one of their partners, Bob Freeman, was arrested for insider trading. He was the head of the arbitrage department, one of the most senior partners of the firm. The fir it, it had the firm been indicted as a whole, the firm would have gone out of business because no firm has uh, uh, saw, uh, survived an indictment as what happened with Arthur Anderson or with Drexel Burnham Lambert. Basically, they go out of business because there, it's a confidence game. You have to have trust in the people who are working there. Goldman Sachs managed to get out of that one uh, without being uh, indicted. In 1994, after having the best year the firm had ever had in 93, where they made $2.7 billion pre-tax. In 1993 dollars, that, that was a lot, a lot of money. In 1994, they made these huge bets against interest rates and, and gambling. Basically, it was a casino. They gambled and they lost, and the firm almost went out of business in 1994. So people forget uh, uh, how dangerous Wall Street really is. And that's, and that's one of the firms that survived. I mean, uh, Ace Greenberg, uh, who was for a long time uh, the senior partner at Bear Stearns, a firm that uh, no longer exists, uh, used to tell the uh, recruits that would come, uh, the, new, the new employees at, at, uh, at Bear Stearns, he would hold up what was called a tombstone ad, which uh, they don't really have so much anymore, but it was a, a huge ad that they'd run in the Wall Street Journal of, of an underwriting, and it would list all the underwriters, and there were hundreds of underwriters. And he would hold up this ad and he would say, you know, look at the names on these, of these underwriters. You know, all of them are gone but Bear Stearns. And now Bear Stearns is gone. So, so more firms, I mean, it used to be a huge number of firms on Wall Street, and now we're down to these, you know, essentially too big to fail firms. And then, you know, obviously, you'll all recall in April of 2010 when the SEC sued Goldman Sachs for this abacus transaction, which was a, what was called a synthetic collateralized debt obligation, which I'm happy to go into, but not now. Uh, uh, you know, basically, they were accused of deceiving their clients, very much like they had done in Penn Central. And of course, this was not something they could possibly allow uh, go to trial or anything near that. So three months later, they settled it for $550 million, paying the largest fine uh, that had ever been paid in Wall Street history. So how does this happen? How does Wall Street keep getting us into trouble? And why are we at their mercy? Why are we victims repeatedly? You know, in my career on Wall Street, which began in 1987 and ended in 2004, every couple of years there was another crisis. There was the Asian crisis, the Mexican crisis, the Russian crisis, long-term capital management, 
There was uh, the internet bubble, there was the crash of 87, the whatever it is, uh, 24th anniversary, is that right? 24th anniversary is today, October 19th, 1987. Uh, not many people in this room uh, remember that because they weren't alive, but nevertheless, it did happen. And, and it was, again, Wall Street's uh, uh, responsibility. So how does this happen and why? Well, I have my theories, and now I'm going to share them with you. It goes back to a very important year, 1970. And I'm not talking about the same 1970 uh, that uh, involved Goldman Sachs and Penn Central, but, but 1970 when the first Wall Street firm Donaldson, Lufkin, Jenrette decided to go public. Before that, for say 200 years, I pick up a number out of thin air, let's say around 200 years, uh, 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 Wall Street firms were private partnerships. They had their partners' capital in them, they were undercapitalized, they didn't have much money, they had what their partners could uh, uh, invest, and they had what they were able to make year after year but most of which was taken out and paid to the partners uh, as, uh, as compensation. So year after year, these firms were relatively small, they were numerous, they were undercapitalized. Not only did these partners have their capital in the firm, but they also had uh, their full net worth on the line in terms of liabilities. They could be sued, there was no corporate veil to protect them. If something went wrong and the, the firm went out of business or they went into bankruptcy or went into liquidation, their creditors could sue them the partners themselves for their entire net worth, not just the capital they had in the company, but their, you know, their house in the Hamptons or their Fifth Avenue apartment or whatever it was. And as a result, these firms, by and large, even though Wall Street was a very dangerous place, were prudent about the risks they were taking. And in 1934, when the Glass-Steagall Act got put into place, which was you know, 35 pages long and basically said, you either choose commercial banking or you choose investment banking, and you have a year to make that choice. Basically, when that got put into place, sort of the speculative side of Wall Street, i.e. The, the securities firms, were separated from the commercial banking deposit-oriented uh, firms that you know, had a responsibility for their depositors. And so, theoretically anyway, the risk was separated. The people who wanted to take risks were separated from the people who had uh, uh, were taking deposits and who, who presumably had a responsibility to their depositors. But in 1970, this all began to change because Donaldson, Lovkin, Jen Red, a very successful, young, sort of upstart firm, uh, uh, decided it was a basically research-oriented firm with a little bit of investment banking. Uh, uh, Dan Lufkin went in to the New York uh, uh, Stock Exchange uh, Board of Governors meeting, his very first meeting, and he shows up there with an S-1 prospectus saying that D Donaldson, Lufkin, Jen Rett wanted to go public. Well, that was against the New York Stock Exchange rules. When Gus Levy, who was head of Goldman Sachs at that time and also head of the New York Stock Exchange, if you can imagine that for a moment, that the head of Goldman Sachs was also head of the New York Stock Exchange and nobody made a fuss about that. Uh, that was really a different era, but that was, you know, 41 years ago. Uh, when he heard that Dan Lufkin and Donaldson Lufkin Jen Rett wanted to go public, of course, he was outraged. Uh, Felix Rowetton, who was the senior partner at Lazard, which was the subject of my uh, first book, he too was outraged. This was a violation of sort of everything that the Wall Street Club believed in. But nevertheless, uh, DLJ persisted, they went public, and very quickly, every other Wall Street firm followed suit. In 1972, Merrill Lynch went public. And then in 1985, Bear Stearns went public. In 1986, Morgan Stanley went public. And of course, in 1999, Goldman Sachs went public. And now every firm on Wall Street basically is a public company. Not everyone. There are now some small boutiques that have sprung up in the, in, in the detritus of the financial crisis. But by and large, most of the big firms, well, all the big firms are public. And even some of the small boutiques, like Lazard went public in May of 2005, Evercore is public, Green Hill is public, et cetera. Even these firms that aren't big sort of gambling organizations went public. And so what did this do? What, what, what this did is it, 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 it substituted partners' money for the public's money. The public's money took out the partners, and it was no longer the partners who were risking their capital. It was now the public in the form of creditors and investors and shareholders. And so you replaced a partnership culture 
where everybody was careful about the risks they were taking and tried to be prudent about the risks they were taking because they didn't want their partner sitting next to them to screw up and it could cost them their, not only their firm, but their every, all the net worth they had built up in their life. They substituted that kind of prudent decision making for sort of a, a, what, what I call the bonus culture, where people get rewarded for taking risks with other people's money. In fact, they take risks with other people's money without any accountability whatsoever. So this has been going on for 40 years. And so a partnership culture, where people sort of watched out theoretically for what the other partners did, was replaced with a bonus culture where the incentive was very simple. Generate as much revenue as you can, year in and year out, taking as much risk as you possibly can get away with. So I think people are pretty simple. They do what they're rewarded to do. On Wall Street, they're rewarded to take risks with other people's money. Now, I was an M&A banker for 17 years, which meant that somebody actually paid me to give them advice about buying and selling companies. Now, I, I, I could never figure out why they did that or, or why they do that at all, but they, they do, and it's a very good business. Uh, margins are like, uh, you know, 80%. Uh, you know, it's pure profit in a, you know, in, in a big deal, uh, you know, like you, you saw yesterday or two days ago with Kinder Morgan in El Paso refinery, whatever it is, you know, $25 billion deal. The fees are hundreds of millions of dollars on the advice alone. It's, 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 it's insane. I don't understand why corporate CEOs pay these fees, uh, but they do, and that's a very uh, interesting and, and important business on Wall Street. And, of course, if you do that and you're good at it, you make uh, millions of dollars a year. Again, why that is, why the fees get paid by corporations, I've never understood. Why these people get paid so much money, I don't understand. But that's at least a business that doesn't risk. That's a reputational risk business. That's not a capital risk business. But there's a big, huge other part of the business. You know, once upon a time, you know, Goldman Sachs made its money from underwriting debt and equity securities and providing M&A advice. I think last year, something like 90% of the money that Goldman Sachs made came from its trading operations and its principal investing operations. The debt and, underwrite, and equity underwriting and M&A business was now 10% of, of the revenues that that firm made. So what is this other business, this, this huge trading uh, business? It's basically a casino, and it's a casino that's been operating with other people's monies now for 40 years. And what happens in a casino? In this casino, people get paid to make bets, taking huge risks with other people's money, knowing that if the risk's paid off in terms of revenue that they generate, they get paid millions of dollars in bonuses each year. If the risks don't work out, What's their downside? There is no downside. Either the corporation absorbs the losses, or if the whole uh, uh, company is going down the tubes, as we've discovered, well, then that's where the American taxpayer steps in and, and helps them out. And uh, it's great work if you can get it. So you've got these people who uh, were once partners with each other, who were prudent about the risks they were taking, and now this sort of bonus culture has taken over in the last 40 years. And as a result, because people get rewarded to take risks with other people's money, well, their behavior changes. So that is a very, very important, let's call that strand one of the Wall Street DNA, this transformation over the last 40 years from a partnership culture to a bonus culture. Strand two is the way people get compensated on Wall Street. In the old days, if you were a partner of a Wall Street firm, you got compensated on if there were any pre-tax profits in the till at the end of the year. If there weren't any pre-tax profits, you didn't get anything. Now, because it's a corporate structure, people get paid in silos. You know, The M&A guys say, oh, look at the revenues I generated. The trading guys say, look at the revenues I generated. And they, they take that pitch that they're so good at making to their bosses, and then their bosses go fight for the, with the corporate powers to, to get the bonus pool. So you'll notice, uh, uh, you know, so far this year, Goldman Sachs has accrued something like $10 billion for, for, for compensation and expenses. Uh, yesterday, uh, we all saw that they lost, you know, $400 million for the quarter. They accrued a billion dollars in bonus, 
bonus of a billion and a half dollars in bonuses. You know, two, two years ago, they had something like $20 billion in bonuses uh, that, they, that they paid out. There's no other business on the face of the earth that pays out between 50 and 60 cents of every dollar of revenue to its employees in the form of bonuses. You could say, oh, a law firm does, or a management consulting firm does. Yes, but I'm talking about public companies that are supposed to exist for the benefit of their shareholders and creditors. Wall Street exists for the benefit of the people who work there. Why anybody invests in these firms, I can't tell you. It absolutely blows my mind because they don't exist for their shareholders. They exist for their employees and their management. And it's true year after year after year after year. They're not hiding what they're doing. It's out in broad daylight and yet uh, people still think about investing in these companies and I don't, I don't understand it. So uh, they get paid for uh, generating revenue and they get paid from the revenues that they generate and between 50 and 60 cents of every dollar of revenue gets paid out in the form of compensation. You cannot think of another business that does that. Uh, Procter & Gamble doesn't do that. Exxon doesn't do that. N none of these companies do that. Now you can say, well, they do that because their cost of goods sold, the, what they manufacture are the ideas of the people who work there, and if you don't pay them, then they will leave and you will lose all of that incredible intellectual capital you've built up over all these years, to which I say, uh, these firms are, operate as a cartel. They are just like OPEC, but they are, are the, you know, uh, they're not treated, we don't think of them like OPEC, or we didn't used to, now maybe we do uh, think of them more, more like OPEC, but they are a cartel, they set prices, they set compensation, they collude, uh, and one thing they collude on is compensation. If Goldman Sachs were a real leader in this industry, they would cut the compensation of the people who work there by 50%, they would still get overpaid, more than any other profession you can think of. Yes, even more than a Williams professor. And, and they, they get paid for doing this without any, taking any risk whatsoever. Wall Street bankers and traders are the most risk averse people on the face of the earth. You know, I don't begrudge Steve Jobs any penny of the $7 billion fortune that he has. Even Mark Zuckerberg, even though he drives me crazy, he can have his $17.5 billion. Why? Because at least they took risks with their ideas and their capital, and they built something, and it has value in the marketplace, and it's worth something, and they're getting rewarded for it. Well, what are Wall Street bankers and traders? I mean, look, I got paid like a rock star, but I can't fathom for the life of me why I deserved it. I wasn't taking any risk with my own capital. I put, had no capital at risk. I had other people's capital at risk. I was an M&A guy, so I didn't have anybody's capital at risk, but you get the idea. They don't take any risks with their money. They are risk averse, and they get paid millions and millions of dollars. Nassim Taleb, who wrote the book The Black Swan, he and I were on a TV together yesterday. He said something fascinating. He said, why is it that bankers on Wall Street get paid bonuses? Why not people who take real risks with their lives people who fight in wars in Afghanistan or Iraq or in the military, those people deserve bonuses, not people who work in cushy jobs on Wall Street. And I had to say, uh, it really had resonance with me. I don't understand why these people get uh, paid the way they do, and I don't understand why this method of compensation uh, has been allowed to continue. The third strand of this DNA is that Wall Street has become really, really good at financial innovation. Why? Because they've attracted MBAs. A lot of people tell me, I think I have a line in the Goldman book where uh, uh, one of the partners told me that, uh, you know, Wall Street changed forever the day the MBAs started getting recruited and coming to Wall Street because they brought too much intellectual firepower. What used to be a business of art now has become a business of science. Uh, you had the, the, you know, mathematics PhDs, the rock, literal rocket scientists getting hired by Wall Street who were able to develop these incredible products that, you know, were supposedly leading to uh, uh, innovation, financial innovation, what I call the democratization of capital. And you know what? And to some degree, it's hard to argue with it. I mean, if you look at Mike Milken, who created what are called junk bonds, uh, uh, high yield bonds, uh, he, he came up with this idea that there were many, many companies that couldn't borrow from banks or insurance companies because their credit rating was too low. So he created this whole new public market for high yield securities that allowed them to borrow 
uh, and get access to the capital markets at attractive rates. That's a real financial innovation. Now, in typical Wall Street fashion, because of the compensation system, the incentive system, this thing got totally uh, uh, blown out of control, and, and this financial innovation soon led to financial disaster, which is what happened in the crash of 1987, uh, exactly uh, 24 years ago today. And other, other innovations were, were Internet IPOs. You know, this whole idea that, uh, uh, you know, 11, 12 years ago, uh, all you had to do was uh, uh, be a bunch of uh, uh, college uh, graduates or undergraduates and, and, and move into a, a loft space south of Market in San Francisco and talk about eyeballs and paradigm shifts. And next thing you know, uh, the, uh, Wall Street was uh, giving you billions of dollars uh, just because you had a, a fancy name like Pets.com. And, and uh, this was, you know, another great, huge innovation in uh, people at uh, Wall Street uh, security analysts like uh, you know, Mary Meeker or Henry Blodger were, you know, talking about this stuff and blowing this stuff up and a huge bubble got created. Well, yes, yes, something real was happening, right? The Internet is real and the companies that have come out of that are real and they needed capital and it's changed the way we all live. But, you know, in typical Wall Street fashion, uh, that became a huge bubble that got, uh, you know, valuations got pumped up to unbelievable levels. People made huge investments in these companies. And when the bubble burst, they, you know, they all got wiped out. And that almost led to, you know, uh, the, the recession that we were feeling in, in 2000, 2001. And then 9-11 basically, you know, finished us off and we went into a, a deep uh, tailspin after that. Uh, another financial innovation is, is securitization. What's that mean? That, that's where, you know, that's what led to this last crisis, where this idea that you could, and this happened, uh, this guy named Lou Ranieri at Salman Brothers, very bright guy in the early 80s, came up with this great idea. If you could uh, package up streams of cash flows, you know, people make payments on their car payments, their car loans, people make payments on their credit cards, oh, people make payments on their mortgages. I can package all this stuff up and, 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 and put it into securities and sell it off as investments around the world. Well, now that's quite an innovation. And you know what? It was quite an innovation. And, and it lowered the costs. I don't, see, I don't really see it in credit cards, but you know, theoretically it lowered the costs of, of borrowing for you know, individuals who never had access to those markets before. It lowered the costs of mortgages. It lowered the cost of car payments. It theoretically lowered the cost of credit cards. Again, I don't see that. Maybe, maybe what was happening is that people could get credit cards who never would have gotten any credit at all. And that was somehow viewed as a good thing. And you know what? For a while, it was a good thing. It was a while, for a while, it was a good thing that we had uh, junk bonds. And for a while, it was a good thing that the internet companies could get capital. But because there's no carburetor on Wall Street behavior, because they get compensated for generating revenue, you know, in other words, the, the rocket scientists come up with these products, and, and the salesmen at Wall Street, because what is Wall Street is just this army of salesmen. They, they get these products and they start selling them and they're really good salesmen and they sell these products and they keep selling them and selling them and selling them and they never stop selling them until the bubble you know, inflates and explodes. Why do they never stop selling them? Because there's too much money to be made. Can you imagine somebody going to Mike Milken at the X-shaped desk and saying to him, you know, we really shouldn't be backing Ron Perlman who wants to take over Revlon because he's going to over leverage the company. It's never going to work out and shareholders are going to get screwed in there and it's not going to work out. Of course not. If he said that to, to, to Mike Milken, that's career suicide. So of course nobody says that. They just go along and go along and go along and credit standards deteriorate and pricing changes and, and you know, it becomes this huge a bubble that gets blown up until it explodes and we pay the price for that. And, and, and you know, one of the places we paid the price for that was this last time with mortgage-backed securities. We all know now how this happened. It was, it was people could get mortgages just by breathing. You know, people could get mortgages to refinance their existing mortgages and take money out and build that addition that they wanted to build, and there was no credit standards, and all you had to do was breathe to get a mortgage. And since, since the mortgage brokers weren't holding them, once upon a time, you would go to your local banker in your community in Williamstown and say, uh, you, you know, you know me, I know you, I want this, buy this house. Yes, Bill, uh, I'll give you this 30-year mortgage. You know me, I know you. Here's the, pa the compact that we'll have is that you will pay your mortgage and you will be able to buy your house. Well, those days are long gone because of Lou Ranieri. Because Lou Ranieri decided, well, you could take all these mortgages that are on these local, in all these local banks' 
uh, 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 balance sheets, package them up as, as securities, get them rated by the credit agencies AAA, who were paid by Wall Street to do that, and sell them off as investments all around the world. I mean, it's an incredible idea if you think about it. It's incredible. It's foolproof. It could never go wrong. And yet, like every other great financial innovation on Wall Street, it gets pushed to excess because nobody has the guts to stand up and say something is rotten. The emperor has no clothes. And so these innovations just get exploded into bubbles that become disasters. Now, of course, it's not only uh, a, a Wall Street. Uh, uh, there's also you know, public policy that has, as we, as we all can imagine, has a big role in this. But really, if you think about it correctly, uh, a public policy, uh, the politicians that make these laws or these regulations by which supposedly Wall Street is, is being regulated, uh, you know, for a long time now have been bought and sold uh, by, by Wall Street. Uh, it doesn't take much to buy a politician. In fact, uh, Goldman Sachs was one of the, the leading uh, uh, financiers of politicians uh, in the last election and, you know, put something like $2 million into it. So, you know, for, for $2 million, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs, I think that's a, like a nanosecond of trading on any given day. Uh, and that's enough to buy um, basically most of the politicians in Washington that they want to buy. And it's been going like this for a long time. I mean, uh, uh, Sidney Weinberg, who was the longtime senior partner of Goldman Sachs, uh, he was in and out of government his entire Goldman Sachs career. Now, this was once viewed as a virtue. Uh, he was a friend of Franklin Roosevelt when he was senator, uh, governor of New York. Uh, when Franklin Roosevelt became the president, uh, he asked uh, Sidney Weinberg to be the ambassador to the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, Sidney Weinberg was a Jewish guy from Brooklyn who didn't speak any Russian, so he quickly vetoed that, thinking it wouldn't be a great idea for a Jewish guy who speaks no Russian to go to the Soviet Union and be the ambassador. But it turned out that he was then asked by the OSS, the, the uh, precursor to the CIA, to go uh, be a spy uh, in the Soviet Union uh, during uh, the Second World War. Uh, he took a leave from Goldman Sachs to do that. Nobody even knew. Not even his grandkids knew when I asked him about it. That, that, that did they know that Sidney Weinberg had done this. He also was head, head of the War uh, Production Board. He recruited uh, executives from General Electric and all these companies all over the country to, uh, uh, to be part of the war effort. This was something that was a birthright at Goldman Sachs. This was a natural. This is something they were proud of. Uh, he, tell, he used to tell the story of how uh, Eisenhower had asked him to go to a meeting in Midtown, and he was downtown at Goldman Sachs' office, and the purpose of the meeting was to figure out who the next, the new Treasury Secretary of the, of the United States should be. So Sidney Weinberg took the subway from downtown to Midtown, and while he was on the subway, he was thinking through in his mind of who should be the Treasury Secretary. And he thought about some people, he rejected some people, and he came up with a, a guy's name, uh, and he to uh, told Eisenhower. Uh, Eisenhower had never heard of the guy, uh, but on Sidney Weinberg's recommendation, the guy was made the Treasury Secretary. This is sort of standard operating procedure. And then when, the, when Henry Fowler was the Treasury Secretary, I believe, under Johnson, uh, was done being Treasury Secretary, he was hired in the 60s at Goldman Sachs as a partner. And that became the first time the revolving door started going both ways. And now we just take for granted that the revolving door goes back way, both, both ways. Uh, you know, it became to the point where we referred to Goldman Sachs as government Sachs because they had so many people working at, uh, on, uh, in government, uh, from Bob Rubin to Henry Paulson to, to you name it, uh, who, uh, including the uh, Bush's chief of staff to the uh, head of the Com uh, Commodities Future Trading Commission, on and on and on, all worked at Goldman Sachs. What used to be considered a virtue, by the way, uh, a serving government uh, is now, in government, is now considered a vice. But so what role did public policy play in, all, in, in this crisis? In this crisis, like in many crises that we've experienced, the role that they played was uh, by encouraging uh, people, you know, one facet of the American dream that we used to think was really, uh, that we believed in and was really important, was owning your own home. So in the Clinton administration, you, there's countless instances where he has gotten, uh, on, you can go on the internet and see he's given speeches where he talks about the power of home ownership, the importance of home ownership, and then to, you know, it became very good 
political uh, uh, propaganda to, to talk about home ownership. And then he encouraged, through the changing of the Community Reinvestment Act, he encouraged uh, uh, banks to make loans and mortgages available to people who had previously been renters and now who he believed should be uh, homeowners. Once upon a time, we had about 62% of this country owning homes. By the end of the Clinton administration, uh, that was up to like 68%. And Bush, by the way, picked up right where Clinton left off. And so we have uh, uh, this uh, uh, focus on home ownership. And as a result, uh, banks were forced to make loans or encouraged to make loans to people who, who had been renters and should have stayed renters, and yet because of this push for home ownership became borrowers of mortgages that they couldn't pay back. And Wall Street, of course, you know, packaged up all these mortgages knowing full well that they couldn't be paid back and put, put them into securities that were then rated AAA by the credit rating agencies who were paid by Wall Street to rate them AAA, and those products were sold around the world as investments. So you see, this was not something that was a once in a century event. This wasn't part of the economic cycle. This was a man-made event that was totally preventable. So when I see the folks down uh, in Zuccotti Park, quote unquote, occupying Wall Street, uh, who don't understand this or any of this, uh, it, it frustrates me and I get disappointed because I have been wondering where the protests have been, and I've been wondering why the American people put up with this crap over and over and over again, decade after decade. And now that the protests here, they haven't taken the time or don't have the inclination or maybe it's youthful enthusiasm or whatever it is to understand this. And so I fear that what they're trying to do down there, when the weather turns cold, and they no longer have, you know, are allowed to stay in their sleeping bags or in their tents or whatever, uh, that this movement is going to die out and we're not going to get the kind of real reform that we need to make sure this doesn't happen again. Because we do have this 2,200-page Dodd-Frank law, which nobody understands, which calls for regulators in Washington to write all of these new regulations that the Wall Street firms are busy lobbying with their lobbyists and their general counsels and their bankers and their traders to get written the way they want them to be written, just like they always have. And, and we're not going, we have a real opportunity to change Wall Street behavior, which is really what needs to happen if we're gonna prevent this kind of crisis from happening again. And I, I'm disappointed, and maybe that comes out as writing condescending editorials because I feel like the moment is finally here and it's being lost because this group of people won't take the time to educate themselves and speak the language that they need to speak to try to force through the kind of changes that I'm talking about and that would try to prevent some of these things from happening again. It all comes down to incentives. People do what they are rewarded to do. On Wall Street, they have been rewarded to take risks with other people's money for 40 years, and they are still rewarded to take risks for other people's money until that, with other people's money. Until that changes, you're not going to get any real change on Wall Street. So with that, I'll stop talking. I'm sure you're relieved about that, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have out there. And I can talk about Goldman Sachs, I can talk about whatever you want. Anybody, don't be shy. This is a university. Yes, sir. There must be some moral people on Wall Street. Do they uh, get converted or just or leave? So the question is, there must be some moral people on Wall Street. Do they get converted or do they leave? Uh, it's a very good question, an insightful question, because the truth is that I think um, people who get recruited uh, from by Wall Street every year from campuses like this, people who maybe even be idealistic about working on Wall Street, who, who, who want to go and work hard and get rewarded for what they do and be part of an important business and a culture that's, that's uh, been around for 150 years or whatever, they start out very idealistic. And what I found in my own experience, because I was one of those people, and what I found in my own experience is 
that the kinds of behavior that gets rewarded on Wall Street over time forces you to make a choice about who you are and the way you want to behave. So uh, uh, the people who seem to get rewarded on Wall Street through promotions and pay and get fast-tracked seem to be these people who start out sort of idealistic and ethical and moral and then over time sort of park that kind of behavior at the door and then sort of do what they have to do. For instance, at Goldman Sachs, as I write in the book, in December of 2006, they made the decision uniquely on Wall Street to make a huge proprietary bet against the mortgage market. They bet the mortgage market would fail. When they made that bet, they were copying one of their clients, this guy John Paulson, the famous hedge fund guy who made a huge bet against the mortgage market, who made you know, $8 billion that year and $10 billion in the other year. But now, is, by the way, his funds are down 50%. Whatever, he's, he's now worth $10 billion because of this bet that he made against the mortgage market. He was a client of Goldman Sachs. Goldman was watching him make this bet day after day for six months and then decided to copy it. And by the way, when they decided to copy it, Paulson was no longer their client. And in other words, he would call them to have him do trades when he was their client, and they would execute it at the best of their ability. When now they're competing against him for the same trade, taking his intellectual uh, uh, ideas and making it their own, which you know, I guess there are no laws against that. I mean, maybe there should be. Uh, uh, but they knew what he was doing uniquely. They copied it. Uh, they made billions. They made $4 billion on this trade in 2007 that they put on in 2006. In 2007, Goldman Sachs made $17 billion pre-tax. The rest of Wall Street was going down the tubes, you may remember, in 2007. That was the year that Merrill Lynch lost $9 billion in the fourth quarter, and Stan O'Neill got fired, and Citigroup, Chuck Prince got fired, and that was the first, the fourth quarter of 2007 was the first quarter that Bear Stearns ever lost money in its 85-year existence. That was the year that Goldman Sachs made $17 billion, and Lloyd Blankfein, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, got paid a $72 million bonus. The same time that they were making this multi-billion dollar bet against the mortgage market, they continued to sell mortgage-backed securities to investors around the world at 100 cents on the dollar. Now, that was a corporate decision that was made, and you tell me what kind of firm does that. On the one hand, they are betting against the mortgage market and profiting, taking their clients' information and profiting to the tunes of billions of dollars. At the same time, they're selling these mortgage securities at par at 100 cents in the dollar to investors around the world that lost you know, nearly all their value. Well, so my feeling is that people come in there uh, idealistic, hardworking, want to do well to succeed, want to get paid uh, too much and all that stuff, uh, and then somehow something gets lost along the way. The culture of these firms takes over, and unfortunately, it ain't good anywhere. Yes, sir. So you blame the corporate system. You move it between the partnership, the corporate system, as a reason why it's not working anymore. But that's not going to switch back. And then you right. say that the corporate incentive system is really bad, but they're not going to cut their own wages. So, so these They are, can. They could. But they but, won't. Well, they could. I mean, unlikely. But, um, but so let's say that we, you have the power to create the platform for Occupy Wall Street, or you can rewrite the Dodd-Frank Act in a way that's not useless. Uh, what, what policies would you suggest, and uh, what would you say? So the question is, is what, if I could rewrite Dodd-Frank or write the platform for Occupy Wall Street, what would I do? Uh, again, that's a very good question. I've written many, many columns about this. So thank you. This is an easy one for me. Uh, uh, you know, I, to me, it gets down to, as I said here several times, the, the incentive system. So you're right. Goldman Sachs is not going to go back to being a private partnership. It's a $50 billion company. It was a $100 billion company. It's not going to go private. So what do you do? How do you create that sense of prudent risk-taking that needs to exist so they don't keep blowing us up? Well, actually, it's sort of a back-to-the-future kind of answer. And Goldman Sachs, uniquely on Wall Street, why, why? You know, Goldman Sachs, I told you, made this bet in 2006 against the mortgage market. This idea bubbled up 
from the trading desk, this obscure trading desk. I write about it in the book, the guys who did it. It's a fascinating story. Uh, uh, it bubbled up, and because Goldman Sachs sort of uniquely on Wall Street rewards uh, uh, ideas that come up from the bottom and filter up to the top, they, 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 they it, again, uniquely on Wall Street, uh, uh, good ideas have huge currency. When I worked at Lazard, uh, nobody cared what I thought about anything. Uh, if I went in to see Felix, I could not get, if I wanted to go see Felix Rowiton with some good idea that I had, like, why don't we call on clients with ideas instead of just waiting for the phone to ring, that kind of thing. Uh, I couldn't get by his two secretaries. He doesn't, had no interest whatsoever in what I had to say. And you know what, that worked fine for them. They made lots of money and they were very successful. Goldman, though, is a real meritocracy. So if a good idea bubbles up, uh, uh, they're willing to give it real airing. And this idea came up about shorting the mortgage market. So the CFO of Goldman convened a meeting in his conference room, and he had all the mortgage people there, and they decided to do this, and they authorized this trade, which is why when Lloyd Blankfein says, oh, no, you know, it wasn't an authorized trade. We were just hedging our portfolio, blah, blah, blah. That's a bunch of crap because it is completely documented. Uh, uh, it's in my book. I've talked to the people. I've looked at the documents. It's all there anyway. He does that because I'm sure his lawyers tell him to do that. But, but the fact of the matter is that why is Goldman willing to listen to an idea like that? The reason is because they have a vestige of the old partnership system still at Goldman. And what do I mean by that? There are these 400 people at the top of Goldman who are called partner MDs. At Goldman, they have MD lights, managing director lights, and then they have these partner MDs. These partner MDs, unlike everybody else at the firm who get paid out of the revenues that they generated, these partner MDs, these 400 guys, these like superhuman alpha male class, uh, they get paid out of the pre-tax profits of the firm just like in the old days. So in 2006, they could, in 2007, they could see real trouble coming in the mortgage market. They knew they were hugely long mortgage securities. So these guys recognized that if there was a good idea for them to reverse this and get short or, or get back to being uh, uh, neither short nor long, uh, they ended up being very short and made a lot of money. But if they could get back and, and mitigate their risk, Lloyd Blankfein said to me when I wrote this book, he spends 98% of his time worrying about things with 2% probability. There's no other CEO on Wall Street who could make that claim. So what's the solution? To me, the idea is simple and it can be done and it goes back to the partnership culture. The DNA of this solution is in every firm that exists on Wall Street and that is to take the top 100 guys at these firms, the guys who make the decisions about who to hire, who to fire, who to promote, how people get paid, you know, the top 100 guys, the real guys and mostly guys unfortunately, should be more women. I think if there were more women on Wall Street, none of this would have happened but that's another subject. For another day, if you take the top 100 people at these firms and force them to have their full net worth on the line again, just like they used to in the old partnership culture. How do you do that, Bill? Well, I've got this idea that I keep talking about. I wrote about it in the New York Times. Uh, everybody, there was only one person on Wall Street who called me up to talk about it, but let me tell you the idea first. The idea is to create a new security that represents the full net worth of the top 100 people at these firms. Let's just say for argument's sake, Say, say it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, worth a billion dollars because these people are worth whatever, 10 million each or something like that. I don't know if that's the math. So, so say they're worth 10 million each and it's worth a billion dollars. Uh, uh, have this new security be created that equals their entire net worth, put it at the bottom of the capital structure. Below the debt, below the equity is this new security. So if something happens... If something gets lost, if there's trouble coming, if the winds are blowing, the clouds are forming, that this is the security that gets lost first. So who gets wiped out first? These hundred decision makers, their entire net worth. And laws can be, you know, courts can be set up to sue these people and to take possession of their homes in the Hamptons and on Fifth Avenue. And you could say, yeah, right, this is never going to happen. And basically that's what everybody said to me. Yeah, right, this is never going to happen. The one guy who called me up to discuss it, and we talked about it for an hour, was Lloyd Blankfein. Why? Because he understood. He told me that the problem on Wall Street and he wouldn't say this on the record, but I'll say it now anyway. <laughs> His, the rest of Wall Street is too stupid, too greedy. 
They, he, they don't think like he, he thinks. He spends 98% of his time worrying about things with 2% probability. I assure you, Jimmy Kane at Bear Stearns, who I wrote about in my second book, he spent 98% of his time thinking about how rich he was and the other 2% of his time thinking about his bridge tournaments and maybe smoking pot the, one, the, other, the other percentage of the time. That's what he thought about. He told me Jimmy Kane lost a billion dollars in Bear Stearns stock when, when Bear Stearns went under. And you could say, well, Bill, there's your whole idea right there. He lost a billion dollars. He had a billion dollars on the line. Yeah, he had a billion dollars on the line. No, he had a billion four on the line. He only lost a billion. He still has $400 million that he had squirreled away. If he had had the full billion four on the line, he wouldn't be playing bridge. He wouldn't have been smoking pot. He wouldn't have had having no idea what the risks his firm were taking. Lloyd Blankfein gets paid out of the pre-tax profits of his firm. He is incredibly aware of whether his firm is making profits or not. Not revenues, profits. So if you had this security that you created in every firm and put it at the bottom of the capital structure, you would have people's attention like a laser beam. People do what they're rewarded to do. It's very simple. Way in the back. Oh, I'll hold it. We go, I guess we're up here first. Yeah. Go ahead, up in, the, up in the rafters. Could I explain? Yes, yes. Could you say a little bit about head fund? You've all heard about head funds in the last decade and a half. So, Sneaky Sand made exactly how all these people make so much money to be head fund managers. And are there tax benefits that um, they're looking at head fund managers? So what can I elaborate a little bit on what hedge funds are, how do they make so much money, uh, and, and do they uh, get tax benefits at our expense? Uh, the answer to the last is yes, they get tax benefits at our expense, of course. Uh, they, write, they help write the laws, and so, of course, they uh, have them uh, geared to their benefit. And how do they do this? Uh, there's this um, um, uh, little uh, payment mechanism. Again, it all gets back to compensation on Wall Street and incentives. There's a payment mechanism in private equity firms and hedge funds called 2 and 20. It's like the greatest scam to make money in the history of the world. I mean, bar none. I mean, I, I don't know what it used to be. Maybe it used to be the cotton gin. Now it's 2 and 20, okay? And wh what this means is that uh, uh, you get a 2% management fee on the funds you have under management. So, so you know, if, if you have, uh, uh, you know, a billion dollars, uh, I don't know, my, my math is escaping me, but I think that's 20 million. If you have a billion dollars, you get, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, you know, you get 20 million. So if you're like Steve Schwartzman, you know, you've got $15 billion, you get 2% of it, that's whatever it is, 300 million a year, whatever the number is. I mean, that is a lot of money right off the top to run your business. And then on top of that, you get 20% of any profits you generate for your uh, investors. Well, obviously you could say, well, Bill, you only get paid if uh, the investments do well. And that's right, except for the 2% part. So you're getting rich on the 2% and the 20% is all gravy. And the 20% gets taxed at capital gains rates, even though your capital isn't at risk. It's your investor's capital. So they're getting a tax break. Uh, they're making huge amount. I mean, there's a reason Steve Schwartzman had his 60th birthday party and spent $5 million on it and had Rod Stewart play because, you know, he's a multi-billionaire. And he's a multi-billionaire because he's been a successful private equity investor, but he also because of this 2 and 20 scam that is also a cartel that should be broken, that, that all these hedge funds and private equity guys, of course, don't want to do anything to, to break it because it's a, you know, a beautiful business. So what then is a hedge fund? A hedge fund uh, is just a, a, a pool of capital uh, that private investors uh, invest in with their own money. They have to be qualified investors. So that means that they basically they sign pieces of paper saying that they are willing to lose the money they invest. And it basically gives the, the, the hedge fund manager the right to invest this money any way they want, in, in effect. It's like a, a, a blank check. And, you know, obviously some hedge funds have uh, strategy A or strategy B or strat strategy C, and, and then, then they get return profiles over time and that attracts capital. Or, you know, when, when John Paulson made all this money uh, betting against the mortgage market, of course, 
he started attracting huge amounts of other investors who wanted to be with him. And what happens? Well, it's inevitable. He, gets, he, he actually believed his own BS. He thought that he knew what he was doing, as opposed to taking a huge uh, 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 risk with other people's money, that it was actually uh, something that was totally irresponsible, because if it hadn't worked out, he would have been wiped out. Uh, uh, he attracts all this money, and of course, he actually thinks he knows what he's doing, but he actually got lucky once or twice, and he really doesn't know what he's doing because he was an M&A guy at Bear Stearns. But, but by then, you know, he's got all this money to invest, and that's why his, you know, funds are down 50% this year because he bet on the recovery, uh, the, the, Amer the recovery, recovery of the American economy, and it hasn't happened. So uh, basically, it, it's, it's a, it, these pools of money that people give voluntarily to, and it's a way for the hedge fund managers, frankly, to get filthy rich. Yes, there was a, a, met, met, a question in the back there that I... Uh, can you offer any thoughts on Obama's Consumer Protection Agency and whether you think it's a step in the right direction? Uh, what do I think about Obama's Consumer, consumer Protection Agency? Is it a step in the right direction? Uh, you know, again, uh, we're spending about $500 million a year uh, for this agency. Uh, you know, I, I guess, I mean, p part of me believes that uh, we, I guess we have to have this because people do not read the fine print on credit cards and on auto loans and on mortgages, uh, on toasters, whatever, whatever it is. If they, if they read the fine print, or if, they, if they just didn't, uh, 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 s uh, want to live beyond their means, uh, then I don't think we would need the Consumer Protection Agency. We wouldn't have to spend $500 million on it. I mean, I wouldn't take out a mortgage uh, that I knew I couldn't pay back. But uh, a lot of people did and do take out mortgages that they knew they couldn't pay, be paid back. Uh, and they took out mortgages where they didn't read the fine print. They didn't realize that they were uh, adjustable rate mortgages that would go up uh, over time, they thought they were fixed rate mortgages or they were bait and switched, whatever it is. The, the problem is there are a lot of bad uh, people in the world who want to take advantage of other people, and so theoretically this consumer protection agency is going to you know, mitigate some of that. I just think it's kind of another big Washington bureaucracy that we don't need. Yes. In the incentive systems are so contrived that hedge funds or Wall Street banks are outnumbered in place. Why do investors keep putting their money in the system? Because that would get you the result, right? Everyone sold all their Goldman Sachs stock. Right, if, exactly, exactly. Right. Uh, if, if the incentive system is uh, so messed up and these Wall Street firms exist for the people who work there and not for the investors, why do people keep investing? And, when, and to your point, ex Exactly. If people sold all their Goldman Sachs stock, Goldman Sachs wouldn't exist anymore. It, it wouldn't, it would, it would, it would, at some point, though, it would be low enough in value that it would be taken private and, and it would revert back to exactly what I just talked about doing. So if people said to themselves, these firms do not exist for the investors, they exist for the If they came to that realization, which to me is so obvious, maybe it's because I worked there for 17 years, uh, they exist for the people who work there and not for the investors, they would, and if, and if you're a creditor, why would you lend money to these organizations? And that's why Bear Stearns went under in March of 2008, because people said, guess what? They don't work anymore. I'm not going to be a lender to these companies anymore. And they couldn't get any funding and they went out of business. And that exactly is the point. If, people, if investors, the power relies, is in the market. The power is with investors, with shareholders, with creditors. If they pulled their, their financing from these firms, they'd go out of business. And, or, or their stock would go down to such a level, or they'd go into bankruptcy or whatever it is that they would then you know, refashion themselves as, as a different entity. Yes, sir. So you don't have an answer to his question? No. The, the, the question, the question well, yeah, the answer is, I don't know why people keep investing in these companies. It mystifies me. There's no reason whatsoever. In fact, I think to some extent, people have come to that realization this year. I mean, Goldman Sachs stock is down 50%, B of A stock is down 75%, all these stocks are down. You know, the great golden, uh, uh, you know, a CEO, Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan Chase, when he came in to J.P. Morgan in whatever it was, 2004, he said it'd be a $100 stock. Well, the stock's never been above 50-something when he's been the CEO, and now it's in the 30s. So, 
I mean, that's, that's our, our para, paragon of virtue on Wall Street is, is, is J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, and, you know, people are beginning to get the message that these are not the place to put your money. Yes. Private partnerships a little more, but obviously hedge funds and other types of investments. Um, would you would you say that um, private equity firm managers should pay um, regular capital gains tax or a very regular tax on what they make? Should should uh, 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 private equity firms pay you know ordinary income tax? You know, there's this as I was saying before, is that uh, this two and twenty gets taxed at uh, uh, capital gains rates, so at 15 percent. So, you know, Steve Schwartzman pays less tax than his secretary, or as we all know, Warren Buffett pays less tax than his secretary on a percentage basis. A absolutely. This is low-hanging fruit for, for, for the Congress or who's ever writing the new tax code or whatever it is. Yes, this is obvious that they should be paying uh, 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 ordinary income rate on, on this money. This is a huge a boon to the industry and, and making these, you know, again, this is something that if, if, if the, the, the Occupy Wall Street people understood a little better what was going on, this would be like plank number, you know, two or something, you know. This is so obvious that they should be paying uh, ordinary income tax rates on this and, and not being able to scam at these lower rates. They're already plenty rich. What more could they possibly buy? I mean, unless, unless they're going to agree to give it all to Williams, then I say they should, they should have it be taxed. Yes, sir. How does what's happened on Wall Street compare to what's happening in Europe? Well, it's, it's all of a piece, you know, where it's, it's, it's the next, uh, it's the you know, second derivative, if you will. I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, because we're so interconnected, because there are all these uh, uh, crazy products that shift risks all around the world, credit default swaps and derivatives, uh, you know, now you have uh, uh, what was a, a private uh, crisis, uh, i.e., you know, Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch, uh, Lehman Brothers, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, AIG, private company crises, uh, you know, Washington Mutual, Wachovia, whatever. Now you have sovereign country crises, so sovereign bank crises, uh, and uh, it's sort of like the next, you know, iteration, and that's what they're struggling with. And then you've got uh, all these uh, a company, uh, countries, uh, uh, tied up like on a rope team, like, you know, going up the side of Mount Everest. You know, if one hiker falls, unless they can really self-arrest, they're all going to go into the crevasse. And that's what you've got going on here with Greece and Portugal and Ireland and, I'm sorry, Magnus, Iceland and, you know, uh, 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 you know, th that, that's really sort of the, what, why we're on the precipice here of something, you know, really serious. And, uh, uh, you know, the Euro countries agreed to be roped up. Uh, and that meant sort of one for all, all for one, and yet here we are at this point of crisis and they don't seem to want to do it. And it's a very, very scary thing. And, and uh, you know, the kinds of violent protests we've seen in these other countries, you can see that we're not far away from that now. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time with uh, Hank Paulson in the writing of this uh, book, and, uh, you know, I know for a fact uh, that one thing he really worried about was uh, violent street protests as a result of you know, the capital markets collapsing or, or the auto industry collapsing, and that's basically why they, one of the main reasons why he told me that they agreed to, to do these bailouts and pursue these bailouts. Yes, sir. What would you say to those of us thinking about opening retirement accounts or planning for retirement? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, now I'm getting above my, my pay grade. What do I think about, you know, people investing for retirement? Uh, in, with these volatile stock markets. I mean, I have lived now in my life, you know, uh, I, I started on Wall Street in September of 87, and in October of 87 there was the crash. So I've seen, you know, 10 of these things now. I've seen the market drop 22.6% in one day, as it did 24 years ago. You know, in, in uh, uh, September and October of 2008, it basically went from whatever it was, 11, 12,000 down to 6,000 in, uh, uh, March of '09. I mean, I'll tell you what I do, but I don't know whether, I, you know, I just stick with it because what else can you do? I mean, uh, you look, you've got money in your savings account, okay, that's getting 0.000001% interest. Basically, the Federal Reserve has agreed to give a gift every single day 
to Wall Street firms who can borrow at the Fed for nothing and turn around and invest in Treasury bills at 2, 3, 4, whatever percent it is. That spread they capture every single day of the week. That is pure profit to these Wall Street firms. And they still can't make any money. So can you imagine if they didn't have that gift? But now, is when we as a nation have become a little bit more savings oriented, we get penalized. We don't get any return on our savings. You know, when the S&P lowered the credit ratings on the U.S. government, and that was such a big deal, remember, two months ago, the chicken little, the earth, the world, the sky is falling. Well, what did everybody do? They invested in Treasury securities. Because, because ironically, what was supposed to be now more risky, everybody wanted because it was the only safe investment around. So you, the yields on Treasury securities are, 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 are close to nothing. I mean, that is another bubble. So where do you put that? And the only place you can conceivably put it is in like high yielding equities because everything else is horribly overvalued. And so that's the problem. We, we've become a casino society. What, you know, this bond that existed, no pun intended, you know, where you, you know, put money away and you save it for retirement and it's good. And whether it's the social security system, your pension, the stock market, the bond market, it's all just become unfortunately part of the casino. And so what I do is I just stick with it. And, and hope that, you know, with 6,000, now became 12,000, and so that was the right decision. Now it's 11,000 something again. You know, obviously, honestly, you know, G starts looking pretty good at $16 a share, and the yield is 4%. Then you get the yield on the 4%, which looks pretty good, and then if it goes up, you know, you get extra return there. But, but I'm no Jim Cramer. I don't pretend to be. I don't want to be. Uh, you know, uh, there are people who get paid, but that, that, that's the only thing I've... I know that the, the worst thing to do seems to be to take it out when everybody else is taking it out. Yes? Now, in the last few years, there's been talk of re-regulating the banks. Not as much as it should be, but there's some. How much of the problem is the fact that all these financial instruments are so opaque and so complex that the regulators uh, may not be able to understand them? And just a little factual matter, by the way, the word for hedge fund in Spanish is speculative fund, which is much more frank. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so I think the question is, what's going on with the regulation, and are all these financial instruments too complicated that even the regulators don't know what they are? I think, I think that the, 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 the answer to that is yes, that they're very complicated, and the regulators don't under, understand them. Uh, I think uh, uh, you know, the head of the CFTC, CFTC, Commodities Future Trading Commission, uh, used to be a partner at Goldman Sachs, he does understand these derivatives. He understands what the dangers are. But, you know, even, and, and he, by the way, I think has gotten religion. I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago uh, on Bloomberg TV. Uh, he, 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 he gets it, but he's faced with all these, uh, uh, these lobbyists and, and, and uh, political forces that are, don't want to change this system, that, that like derivatives being opaque and hard to value. Uh, and, and so that these Wall Street firms can make all, all this money. I mean, as I, uh, I illustrate in the book, I mean, Goldman Sachs at the same time that it was shorting the mortgage market uh, had also uh, 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 insured its mortgage risk with AIG. AIG made this really bad mistake of deciding to uh, insure the risk worldwide in the mortgage market. A really, really, really bad mistake. A really bad uh, judgment. Uh, and but Goldman was smart enough to, you know, hedge out some of its risk uh, with uh, uh, AIG, and they did it with credit default swaps, and they did it with other derivatives. And then they were allowed to uh, make margin calls against AIG, uh, have AIG put up more collateral on these securities if they lost value. So Goldman Sachs. This is really, really clever uh, business that Goldman was up to. I would say absolutely immoral. Uh, they, at the same time they were shorting the mortgage market, they were writing down the value of their mortgage securities. They were then turning and saying they were worth, you know, they weren't worth 100 cents on the dollar, they were worth 70 cents on the dollar. And then they were saying to AIG, okay, now these securities are worth 70 cents on the dollar, you owe me 30 cents on the dollar because you insured that risk with me. And AIG would say, hold it, no, 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 no. We think they're worth 100 cents. And then they would have these big collateral call debates. And this is all documented. It's in my book. And basically, over time, AIG kept losing the debates. The value of the securities kept going down and down. And that's why AIG went out of business, because they had to put up all this collateral that Goldman Sachs you know, kept demanding from them. So, so 
Basically, they like the fact that these securities are hard to value and are opaque and nobody knows how to value them. What the Dodd-Frank law is trying to do, and we'll see if it happens, is put some of these derivatives on an exchange so that the price uh, can be e more easily determined, that the buyers and sellers can know each other in the marketplace and set these prices and make it clear that the value of this security is 87 cents and therefore both sides agree, as opposed to one side saying it's 90 cents and the other side saying it's 60 cents and now you put up this collateral. So whether we get there, I don't know or not. But the problem is it's never been that there isn't, uh, uh, pl there's plenty of regulation, there's always been plenty of regulation on Wall Street. Regula regulation up the wazoo, the 33 Act, the 34 Act, the 40 Act, I mean, all the, it's mind-boggling, the SEC, all these things. You know, the problem is that they don't get enforced because the regulators are in the pocket of Wall Street and because the incentive system, to sound like a broken record, is all screwed up. If the incentive system was right, then, these then it would be in people's incentive on Wall Street not to sell products that they knew were crap. Yes. Speaking of the lobbyists, it seems that um, a, lot of, a lot of these uh, reforms, at least in the legislative uh, arena of things, uh, are unlikely to happen without, um, without dealing with the lobbyists and uh, with campaign contributions as well. First, uh, do you have anything to say about how we can move forward in terms of stopping the revolving door that way? How do you stop the revolving door? How do you stop Wall Street from influencing Congress? I mean, the only, the only thing that I can think of is have uh, p public financing. Uh, you know, uh, uh, every, every uh, uh, no, no more private financing uh, of, of candidates. Uh, no more contributions. Uh, you know, uh, whoever the candidates are in a race gets staked to so much money. That's all the money that they got. That's all the money they can use. They can't use their private money. They can't use uh, uh, the contributions. And that's what they got. And so that, and if, you know, whoever wins and loses after that, that's fine. There's no, no influence, nothing. And, you know, the lobby, I, I think the lobbying would sort of, you know, kind of drain away or would be completely different than it is now. I, I, I don't know. Beyond that, I don't know. We have uh, a lot of problems in this country that, uh, you know, people in your generation are going to have to try to figure out how to solve because our generation has blown it. <laughs> one more. Okay, one more. Oh, you've had one, so maybe this fellow here in the... If you could go back and change the way the government dealt with uh, the bailouts and letting Lehman fail, how would you do it? If I could go back and change how uh, the government dealt with the bailouts, uh, what would I do? Um, I've thought about this a lot. Uh, and uh, the, the answer is um, I would have let Bear Stearns fail. Uh, uh, you know, I've, I've written a book about this. I know why they did what they did. I know what they were thinking. Uh, and I don't fault Hank Paulson and Tim Geithner and Ben Bernanke uh, for doing what they did. They thought it was the right thing to do at the time. Uh, they thought that if they could put their finger in this dike and prevent this firm, you know, when, when they decided to save uh, Bear Stearns, it was the first time in American history that the U.S. government had stepped in to save a securities firm. I'm not talking about a bank. Bank is different. This is a securities firm that was separated by Glass-Steagall, you know, commercial banking and investment banking. This is the first time they had stepped in to do it. They knew they were doing something unusual, but they did it because they thought if they could stem the tide with, with Bear Stearns and, 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 and restore confidence, that that would be a good thing. Uh, uh, Basically, Bear Stearns failed because nobody wanted to do business with it anymore. It was so heavily reliant on short-term overnight, what was called overnight repo financing, that uh, when that financing dried up, they couldn't open for business anymore. They couldn't do any business anymore. Even though they had $18 billion of cash on their balance sheet, they needed $75 billion a day to operate. And the difference between the 18 that they had and the 75 that they needed were these short-term overnight lenders. And when they went away, uh, that was the end of Bear Stearns. The whole securities industry model was built on that, and it was a failure. It was a disaster. It should have been allowed to fail. I have this um, uh, a, a fantasy uh, that, uh, I don't know if you remember Terminator 2. Uh, there's that, uh, that uh, great villain who's made out of uh, uh, mercury or, you know, liquid 
uh, something like that. And after he does uh, all these horrible things to Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, he melts down and then he reformulates uh, the next thing you know into a different uh, horrible creature that comes after uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger again. That, that's, what, well, that's what needs to happen here. Uh, these firms should have just melted down. You know, all these people who claim that they believe in the free markets and these Republicans who talk about the free market system and libertarian behavior and everything. Hank Paulson was like one of the biggest Republicans that existed. And what did he do? He created these bailouts. So why not let the, we should have let the free market work. Yes, it would have been a mess. We saw what the mess was. It was Lehman Brothers. We saw that. But if they had let Bear Stearns fail, I can assure you Dick Fold wouldn't have been waiting around for six months hoping for his bailout too. He would have sold Lehman Brothers. Uh, Merrill would have been, been sold. It all would have happened much quicker. The market would have reacted. They would have gotten out of the short-term financing business. And there would have been a lot of pain. But out of all of that, sort of a new Wall Street would have arisen that would be more utility-like doing what they should do for us, not for them, but for us, which is, you know, raise capital wherever it's needed 24-7 around the world, whether it's debt or equity financing, provide some M&A advice to overpaid M&A bankers, why they pay, the CEOs pay these fees, I don't know, but, you know, that's fine, that doesn't risk anybody's capital, provide a little investment advice, if you're stupid enough to take it from a Wall Street firm, fine, you can do that. But that's the business these firms should be in, not this casino-like behavior that's been gone on for too long. If they had let Bear Stearns fail, that's what would have happened. All these other firms would have probably collapsed too, and out of that would be a whole new set of Wall Street firms that would be much more uh, focused on what their clients wanted instead of competing with their clients or, or trying to take advantage of their clients, which is basically what Wall Street does now. So I'm sure a lot of you want to go to Wall Street you might want to think about it again after this conversation. <laughs> Thank you.